Welcome to Radar Show, a digital platform hosted by Champions of Peace to provide a digital platform for online and offline viewers on issues to do with peace and security, mental health, gender issues, youth and governance. And the reasons why we are doing this, a lot of people nationally and internationally are relying on the digital spaces to get information. And some of those information are distorted. And therefore, this platform provides an ample opportunity for various professional panelists to provide insights on different thematic areas. So today, our second series, we have our ABO panelists. On my far right, we have Janet P. Anyango, Deputy Executive Director for FIDA Kenya. Welcome, Janet, to the show. And congratulations to your appointment as the deputy. Thank you so much. At the center, we have Beatrice Njeri, uh, Senior Litigation Counsel at the Center for Rights Education in Kenya. Karibu, Beatrice. Asante. Today, we are discussing issues to do with prevention of violence against women and girls in Kenya. And the discussion we want to have is on femicide. From December up to now, is a national discussion which requires a robust and candid discussion and to provide a roadmap for remedy. Mm -hmm. Number two, we also want to discuss the issues to do with murder of women in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. What is pushing this targeted murder of women in the rural areas? Mm -hmm. Then the third part is what are the issues as part of redress, mm -hmm. both from non-state and non-state actors. Mm -hmm. So to start us off, I want to start with you Janet, femicide, mm -hmm. are you happy with the statistics? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Eli, for inviting us yes. to this conversation today. Yes. Uh, on behalf of FIDA Kenya, we have strongly come out and done statements. We have done uh, media uh, briefs about our displeasure uh, with the rising number of cases of femicide in this country. It is our constitutional right to be protected. We have a right to life. Article 26 guarantees every citizen in this country a right to life. But we are seeing a trend whereby young women, older women, girls are being targeted. And for us, we are saying that this is it's, it's gender-based violence. We are being targeted just because we are women. And we need to understand what exactly are the root causes of this. We need to um, really be a society that stands up for each other, you know, such that when these cases are happening, can we just stop blaming the victims? Can we stop shaming them? Can we give a safe space for them to report? Mm -hmm. So I know we are going to have a robust conversation about this, yes. but for now we are extremely sad. We have expressed our displeasure. We have called upon the government and non-state actors to all join efforts into this uh, conversation here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Beatrice, you are working in an organization mandated to increase advocacy. Yes. Why do you think the government is mum? And few people are talking, like FIDA, your organization, Mind the Lawyer, and like few. Why are people mum? Well, Women are being killed in our villages. Mm -hmm. Young people are being killed, murdered in residential houses. Mm -hmm. um, let's begin from the point of saying that this is not the first time mm -hmm. as women of Kenya we are having this conversation around femicide. Mm -hmm. In 2019, we had a similar and big protest, conversation, robust discussion mm -hmm. um, with uh, the government, with non-state actors, everyone was involved in that conversation to condemn the rate of femicide that had risen as at that time. Um, however, I tend to think that uh, we are a very forgetful nation. We get carried away by other things. And so in the last uh, week or so, we have seen government actors come out to condemn strongly the femicide uh, cases happening. Uh, but what we are keen to see is the sustainability of the action. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges we have had is the rate of 
cases in court. We remember the case of Ivy Wangeshi, who was uh, a victim of femicide. Mm -hmm. She was murdered and her family was um, pursuing the case in court mm -hmm. for years mm -hmm. before they got justice. And even when the sentence was issued, it was not satisfactory to the family, as yeah. they said, mm -hmm. for the pain they had endured all through those years mm -hmm. and the journey they had gone through the court. For them, I can congratulate them for being strong Bold. enough yeah. to pursue that journey. Yeah. However, I think the government needs to do more. We need to see more from the state actors because they're the ones who have the responsibility to end violence yeah. against women in Kenya. Yeah. And um, we will not relent until we see that form of accountability and strong action yeah. coming from the government. Yeah. Let's not... Um, trivialize women's issues because absolutely, that is what absolutely. that is what happens so uh the activists will protest fida and crew kenya and mm -hmm. all other women uh, of kenya organizations community members will all protest against uh violence against women mm -hmm. but that will the conversation might just die down there mm -hmm. as long as there's no sustained quest for accountability mm -hmm. The government falls back and we are calling on them to act towards prevention of uh, femicide, towards prevention of violence against women, because they have an obligation to absolutely, do that absolutely. under international law and also under our constitution and other national laws. Absolutely. Under the 10, 2010 constitution provides an elaborate framework to protect human rights, mm -hmm. irrespective of being a woman, a child, a man. Janet. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the push factors wha which make our women and girls vulnerable? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say that for femicide, it's just an opportunistic uh, trend that we are seeing mm -hmm. because we are seeing young girls being lured uh, into, into their assailants, uh, I would say arms, literally, because uh, from the trend we are seeing people who are earning your trust, you mm -hmm. know, and then in those private spaces, in the most vulnerable of your spaces, they take advantage and hurt you. So what we are saying is that it is highly opportunistic and we need to ask ourselves what exactly is, is causing this, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because um, we don't want people to be excused uh, for or rather people not to take action for, for not to take responsibility sorry for their actions so yes. we are saying that whatever happens we have to protect the right to life we cannot curtail women's rights to um, associate with people uh, the way they want or associate in whatever spaces mm -hmm. uh, we've seen uh, instances where uh, some of these women met their assailants in dating sites mm -hmm. or, ra or rather in the internet space so for us, it's more about how safe can we make those dating sites? Because we've had instances where people have fake accounts mm -hmm. in dating sites, for example, or people create fake accounts and they will just want to pose like they're someone who is interested in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are saying that we, we can't curtail women from associating or rather from meeting uh, people in whatever spaces they want to or mm -hmm. young girls. Mm -hmm. But then how safe can those spaces be? How can the government ensure better regulation for uh, those kind of spaces? Because um, how, how would someone just create a fake account, for instance? So how, how accountable can, can the government make uh, those spaces that before you register, we are actually able to trace and know that this is Janet, this is my image, these are my fingerprints, mm -hmm. this is where I am found, this is where I live and all that. Um, apart from that, I would say that there's also a lot of cultural things that uh, mm -hmm. are then at play. There's patriarchy being manifested clearly yes, yes. because um, mm -hmm. we, we, we had acknowledged that from the statistics we are seeing also a trend of uh, older women being targeted. So Absolutely. like mm -hmm. why would anyone want to uh, rape an older woman or why would they want to just kill her? Why would someone who's lived in your society the, her entire life all of a sudden become a witch, for example. We've seen the trend, uh, what is happening in Kisini, Amira County, where older women are being targeted and they're being um, uh, killed. Some even in open, broad daylight, they're being lynched. So 
why, 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 is, why are we not having conversations about yes. these stereotypi, stereotypical behaviors, uh, or rather just the patriarchal uh, norms that are then uh, perpetuating this kind of violence? Because for the cases in Kisi and Yamira, when you look at them deeply, and that's why we are saying it's time we interrogate the root causes of this uh, violence. You find that uh, some are even attached to land rights, you know, that mm. people just still believe in this age and era that women are not allowed to inherit property. So it's high time we have that conversation. And then, uh, of course, just for crafting measures around prevention. Absolutely. You mm. know, that let's, let's advocate more to prevent this sort of violence. And it will happen if we have honest conversations, if we interrogate the root causes, if we allow women to share their lived realities, because I have seen a lot of trends in social media of late, of uh, now women coming out slowly and still cagey, you know, mm -hmm. because we are, we, are, we are shaming them. We are saying, mm -hmm. why did you find yourself in that? That is not the kind of conversation to have now. Yes. The Absolutely. conversation is that, why is this happening and what should we do to prevent, you know, so that we don't have all these patterns of cases. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Mm. So very, very, very critical issues you are bringing across. Number one is particular nature of our society. Mm. Not only African society, even in the West. When you look at the composition of the, the UN Security Council, mm -hmm. it's a, a male-dominated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we cannot use particular nature of society as an excuse. Mm -hmm to really belittle women and girls in our society. So Beatrice, Janet has talked about vulnerability. Mm. Do you think our girls and women are more aware of dangers of digital security, safety in the digital spaces? Because those guys in the digital space are taking advantage of our ignorance. Do you think we are, there's an awareness? Um. I will answer your question in two ways. Yes. Uh, to begin with, of course, there is not much awareness uh, on the part of girls. Uh, some of them are just looking for a partner. They are looking for love, genuine love, just the same way yes. any other human being would desire to be loved and to have a partner. Some of them have other push factors that have led them to be more vulnerable um, to being lured into, you know, lucrative. Uh, money or whatever it is that they have been desiring because of the other factors poverty lack mm. of education perhaps these are victims of sexual violence or mm. other forms of violence against women that have led them to pursue uh, whatever it is however I don't think being in a dating site is wrong because it is not only women who are in those dating sites yes those dating sites belong to men and women mm. it is not wrong for a human being to pursue love how then should uh looking for love in a dating site that has both men and women lead to the death of women only yeah. i think it is um education is lacking for both women and men and i say even more for men because whenever we speak about violence against women it is pushed as a women's issue However, it is the men who are perpetrating the violence. Absolutely. So I would frame it as men's violence against women. Mm -hmm. It is the men who are killing women. Mm -hmm. So if it is for me, I can do all I want to protect women. However, for as long as men hate women, they will mm -hmm. always kill them. Absolutely. So for me, education is needed more mm -hmm. for men mm -hmm. to have these conversations among themselves uh, to tackle the issues that uh, Janet was speaking to earlier about gender stereotypes. A woman should be like this, a woman should not be like this, they should dress like this, they shouldn't. Those are things that have been overtaken by time. Mm. However, those harmful stereotypes, social norms are the ones that are still driving men to perpetrate violence against women, to kill women, to batter women. You could even be doing the most womanly thing like the woman who was um killed cooking ugali in her house mm -hmm. was she in a dating site mm -hmm. no she was doing the most gendered role that she should be doing however as a woman you are not safe anywhere you could be killed when in a dating site you could be killed when cooking ugali in your house when 
anything happens yeah. to a woman. Yeah. So for me, the education is more for the men yeah. and they should take up that role yes, to re-educate themselves on, on the root causes yes. and that the gender stereotypes, the harmful social norms that they have been having, yeah. those uh, backward cultural notions yeah. that they have should end. For, for example, if we talk about elderly women, I tend to think that the reason they are being targeted, in addition to the land rights and all that, is because they, have, they are no longer of any use to men. Because they are past their reproductive age. So these women are not um, appealing to the men. They are of no use to them sexually because men feel entitled to women's bodies. So because they have lost that appeal by time, they are not going to give birth. They are probably now uh, relying more on society to help them with their everyday role. Then for men, they feel like a burden. So why not eliminate them? So for me, the education rests on the men. They need to do more. Even as we try to do more awareness on the girls, we could try to speak about all the ways a woman could keep herself safe, but she will still be attacked. She will still be violated. Well put, Beatrice. Mm -hmm. Janet, mm -hmm. Beatrice has uh, mentioned something very critical, mm -hmm. that this violence is violence, men perpetuating violence mm -hmm. to women. Mm -hmm. What is the role of men into this discourse mm -hmm. as we want to front advocacy strategies mm -hmm. to prevent women and girls? The role of men. Mm -hmm. And we acknowledge the national strategy mm -hmm. for gender sector working group. Mm -hmm. They have added the, the main pillar mm. into this kind of, of engagement. Mm. How useful will it be? Yeah. So uh, thank you, Ellie. And I think for a long time when yeah. we've had these conversations about yeah. gender, mm. there's always that um, attempt or rather um, lean, it seems to lean more towards women. So when anybody hears gender, they think it's a women's affair. And as Beatrice has rightly put it, it's not a women's affair, yeah. you know. Gender means men and women. Yeah. So I was particularly excited when um, the intergovernmental framework that uh, coordinates uh, uh, gender responsiveness in counties, uh, what we are calling the gender sector working groups, have decided to put a fifth thematic area yeah, yeah. Uh, of male inclusion, yes. you know, in the advocacy we've been doing around uh, women leadership, peace and security, women empowerment, mm -hmm. and also um, the issues around gender-based violence. So mm -hmm. it is very intentional to then bring men into these conversations. And uh, I know we've done a lot of work towards recruiting male champions, mm -hmm. you know, in the outfits we work with, in the mm -hmm. community-based organizations, paralegals, women rights uh, defenders. So. I believe that just as Beatrice says, let's focus more on the prevention. So the advocacy around prevention is that one, we are bringing these men to be at the forefront. So part of it is also just talking about mental health, you know, sure. because I feel that there's a gap in terms of people just accepting rejection, you know. That's why we are saying that as women, if I'm approached by a man and I say no, can that no mean no? And you know now, we are having conversations about people who are dead. And I'm just wondering, there's so many cases that we are doing of rape, defilement, attempted rape, and even sexual harassment. Yeah. It starts from that part where somebody is not able to accept rejection, mm -hmm. you know. And I am using the strong term rejection, but that is what it is. <laughs> if I don't like you, I don't true. like you. If you absolutely. don't like me, you don't like me. And let's just move on, come <laughs> on, true. you know. So mm -hmm. part of it is... How do you handle rejection? You may genuinely like someone, but if they don't feel your vibe, please move on. Yeah. So then also, as what Beatrice has said, there are certain things that could have then been as a result of our socialization or how somebody was raised. And if you discover it's a problem, then you need to seek help. You know, that's why now we are. I feel that we need to really integrate the mental health aspect of it. You know, the psychosocial support and the fact that if 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 you are having a problem around um not knowing how to handle a no or or just some i would just call them sexual fantasies or fetishes then you can actually get help because uh, there's a way that can be uh, addressed so i i will just add my voice to call the men to 
come out and speak out please share your experiences as well because probably um they are not talking but i i believe if we address those things that we are calling stereotypes we are calling uh, gender stereotypes because also men have been cultured to keep silent you it's know true. that you, when you speak out you're not man enough it's true. It's that, true. that is that is not uh, acceptable in it's this true. age and yeah. era it's and true. also you just keep saying that when someone comes out let's support them let's yes, not so. shame them, shame them. Mm. you know uh, there's been so many um, good steps that we've seen like the police service now are more uh, receptive yes, though gender, of course yes. we've also had mm. some of them who are not that receptive because uh, when the matara case came out i saw women saying that we have reported this man before yes, sorry and not much not much has been done towards yes. uh, uh, even investigation you yes. know or even uh, uh, apprehending them so yes. there, there there could be certain uh, people in the police service that are yet to really up their game but i know the functional gender desks mm -hmm. have really learned that you cannot victim shame, victim shame anymore yes. listen support these uh, uh, victims because we are now moving towards a victim-centered approach absolutely, it's not absolutely. just about that perpetrator it's also about the victim and their family absolutely yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. uh, Beatrice, uh, just following up on uh, janet's what are the other strategies we can use to prevent all this men Predominantly, we don't shy away from talking. Mm -hmm. And that's why when the worst comes to the worst, we do things which at the end we, we regret. Mm. What do you think, what should be done, especially to men? Because it's <laughs> violence, it's men men's opportunity. Men's violence. Violence. Yes. Violence against against women. Yes. Yes. Um, I will not say what I think <laughs> should be done to men. I have um, ideas that yeah. might be <laughs> a bit on the extreme end. Mm -hmm. However, this I is an open space. <laughs> yes, open space. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let me start uh, from the point where yeah. we include all actors, yes. state and non-state actors. Sure, sure. So, categorizing men as non-state actors because most of the people when they hear non-state actors, they think about NGOs, CBOs, CBOs um, mm -hmm. uh, rights organizations, uh, other forms of organizations, mm -hmm. feminists in Kenya, you know, all these people who are organizing yes. uh, collectively against an issue. Yes. However, non-state actors also includes me and you. Absolutely. What are we doing in our private spaces? Yes. I have seen men, uh, especially in the wake of suicide, uh, I mean in the wake of femicide, mm -hmm. come out strongly to speak against it to condemn it, mm. to have candid conversations yes. among themselves. Mm. I have seen a generation of younger men who are doing it, perhaps men in their 30s uh, to 40s bracket. Mm. And that is a fantastic opportunity mm. that I would also encourage other men to participate in. Go to those forums where men have organized, have a candid conversations among yourselves so that you interrogate mm. all those reasons that you list for violating women. Mm. Are they truly valid? Absolutely. And if you are a perpetrator because you were born in a home where violence was it's normal to you, yes. then if you go to a forum of that nature, you're able to know that violence against women is not normal mm. as you have normalized it in your home. You might not just be aware because you grew up seeing your mother being beaten or your sisters being beaten, your sisters being violated, and that you have a role in speaking out against it. Mm -hmm. And that if you truly have those, uh, that very archaic reasoning, yes. then you have a mental health space, a safe space where you could interrogate your beliefs and have, start to learn to change. Because if we know something is wrong, then once we have the knowledge, we aim to do better to uh, stop those uh, behaviors. Mm. So that is what uh, I would say as far as men are concerned and what they could do. Mm. Find those spaces where there is male inclusion, male engagement, absolutely, absolutely. all those conversations that are happening. Mm. Educate yourself. There is so much information that is online around femicide put together in country-specific context. Mm. There is so much information. Uh, honestly that you have no excuse in this day and age as a man 
to be violating <laughs> a woman <laughs> in the uh, in the form of uh, I am not aware. There is so many even community radio stations are having these conversations. The conversations are on Facebook. They are every excuse me. They are everywhere. So the reach of information is there, okay. and it is up to them to also take initiative because. If you're saying, then I will, the, the way they say it is I will protect my, my mother, mm -hmm. my wife, my sister, but protect women because they are human beings. Absolutely. Just the same way you don't want to be violated as a human being, mm -hmm. not because they are a lesser being. Thank you. That's a good way to conclude it. Mm -hmm. Men should protect their mothers, mm -hmm. their sisters, their cousins, mm -hmm. because these women are their mothers, their sisters. And so they are in our wives, they are our lovers, mm -hmm. our best mates. Janet, 2010 Constitution is, has been proclaimed as one of the progressive documents mm -hmm. in the entire world. Yeah. What are still the gaps, legal gaps, mm -hmm. which try to perpetuate this violence? Are people taking advantage of certain legal mm -hmm. gaps? Well, so indeed the Constitution is very progressive and for us in civil society, we are more excited about our Article 2 that allows us to uh, highly rely on international law, treaties, conventions that have been uh, signed and uh, ratified by Kenya. Mm. So um, for us, we say that uh, this gives us then an avenue to do a lot of advocacy mm. on how better to protect women and girls. And then our constitution also gives very protective provisions. You know, like the right to access justice is a right enshrined within the constitution. Absolutely, absolutely. But then the reality of it becomes uh, what I like to call a mirage, you know, like it's not even uh, attainable yet. Because, uh, for instance, now uh, we have all these cases that have been reported. So... Um, as, a, as, as the government, the first responsibility would then be assign counsel for the family to ensure that they are able to uh, give um, support to the victim's family, mm -hmm. just being given uh, legal information about what their case is about, just preparing them, you know, uh, the government giving even a safe space because these people even need they need to step out of their environment to even just recover. If you saw the Raisambu case, the family requested us to just give them some time to mourn their child, you know. True, so true. in that space, you and, and they would fault the government, yes, and still say the government failed us. But then even as the government failed them, I feel that there's still an opportunity for the government to ensure redress to the family. So what does this redress look like? Mm -hmm. That first, the police service and the uh, uh, investigations are able to do proper thorough investigation and just to be able to bring these perpetrators to book then as they present themselves in court i have seen now the judiciary has even made a step to give what we are calling specialized courts that are going to be listening to these uh, gender-based violence cases yeah. uh, initially the idea was just around the sexual gender-based violence cases but these conversations around making it a gender justice court such that these kind of cases can also be fast tracked there because Absolutely. the survivors are saying they are tired, they are mm -hmm. tired and they are tired. So there's a lot of gaps. In as much as we have the National Legal Aid Act uh, that, then, that then gives that uh, assurance that you know what, you will get, you'll get counsel for free. I think it's high time in this country we make preventive uh, services for women, what we are calling essential service, that in the event that there are these kind of cases, you must be given a lawyer as a matter of right, like like an emergency. You, sure. The same way we, we treat, or rather we want to subject uh, women to uh, the treatment, the medical treatment, let us prioritize their humanitarian needs, you know, their, their, their mental health needs. Let's prioritize as we, as we run through the trial, yeah? Mm. And this is what we are trying to call the victim-centeredness, you know. Sure. It's not about just the perpetrator. It's not about trying to find wh where is this person who did this and subjecting them to the criminal process. But even as this happens, I still feel that our laws are not, uh, are not, are not at the point where you are able to give effective remedy. I remember you said that we can talk about the right to remedy. Yes. Because remedy means that, you, you know what, we want to correct the wrong. Yes. 
Okay. So correcting the wrong in our system most of the time has been to bring the perpetrator to book and that's it. In fact, in, in most cases, will be we've given you cons compensation, that's it. That's not sufficient, you know. So let us find out what the family feels that if, if that happens, then they would, they would have closure. Mm -hmm. I like to call it closure, mm -hmm. but it's not easy. It's not easy to lose a family member out of these kind of circumstances. It's not easy, and I really feel for the uh, families of the victims so far. Mm -hmm. And I also just take this opportunity to pass my condolences and to say that for us as an organization, we are very ready to support them through uh, the process when they are ready uh, to get through the criminal trial and just get justice for them. But at the end of the day, it's also for the government to really integrate what what an effective remedy really looks like in the eyes of these uh, victims' families. Yeah, so there's a lot of gap in that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet, for your elaborate explanation.